All right. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Um, very excited to uh, chop it up with you all. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share on your platform. Um, you know, the way we're going to do this is that um, I'm going to just uh, uh, jump into our uh, slides um, and I'll do a little intro by myself uh, from there. So let me see. Share screen. Slideshow. Beginning. All right, do y'all see the full screen? Is that coming yeah, up? That's good. All right, so um, like I said, my name is Deron Chavis. I've been involved in uh, urban agriculture. I'm an activist. I've been involved in this work of community activism for close to 20 years. Um, my work around urban agriculture has lasted at least a decade since two 2008 when we first started doing work in community. Today I'm going to talk about how we build resiliency through urban agriculture uh, and I'm going to be highlighting the Resiliency Garden Project and how that manifested itself uh, as a byproduct or a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> uh, before I get started, um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people that are uh, at Capital One might be new to the city, uh, but this is Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Richmond, Virginia is uh, a city with almost 240,000 people. Uh, the region has several million people, but in the city itself, in the core, uh, we have uh, 25 or 20, somewhere between 24, 26% poverty, uh, which means it's about one in four individuals live in, uh, below the live in or below the poverty line. Uh, that poverty is concentrated in the east end of Richmond and in the south side of Richmond. Uh, the uh, concentrations of poverty are a byproduct of historical uh, policies, uh, particularly uh, policies around housing discrimination, uh, redlining, uh, the creation of the highway, the uh, interstate highway systems destroyed several black neighborhoods. Um, we can go back further than that in documenting how wealth was concentrated uh, and poverty was concentrated in the city. Um, you know, things like white flight uh, as a result of Brown versus the Board of Education and massive resistance here in Virginia. We can go back even further and talk about slavery. Uh, uh, and even back further and talking about the dispossession of indigenous lands upon which we stand here uh, in this region. But a lot of times we go back that far, people eyes gloss over and, you know, they shut down. So we're going to start with the redlining piece because that's my grandma's uh, era. She was um, alive and well uh, when redlining was taking place in the city. Uh, my mom was a baby. Okay, so we'll start there. Uh, redlining, uh, we'll get more into that a little later as I go through. But the way I'm going to start this talk off after, you know, just get that historical context, contemporary context, we're in Richmond, Virginia, out the way. I'm going to dive into some data. We're going to do some maps first, and I'm going to talk about the problem, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and then we'll move into what we've been doing about the problem, what we've been doing about the problem. And um, uh, then the contemporary work of the Resiliency Garden Project. So first map, number one, as I was saying, uh, city of Richmond, uh, poverty is concentrated in the south side and the east end and the uh, north side of Richmond. Um, so as you can see, uh, the legend, uh, uh, the darker brown, the census tract, uh, the higher the poverty. Uh, and as you can see, uh, that poverty highest concentration is in the east end of Richmond, but it's not slacking off in the south side, you know, um, that's why I was raised. I was born on the south side of Richmond. I'm a native Richmonder. So all of my stomping grounds in my early age was done around these parts. Um, but it's also in the north side, uh, downtown creeping up into, um, Barton Heights, the Long Chamberlain Corridor, et cetera. Gilpin Court, uh, but as we go out into the West End, uh, it, it, it diminishes significantly, all right? And that's representative of the patterns of white flight from the city and et cetera, 
during the 60s. Uh, map number two. This is a map of uh, food access in the city of Richmond. These green uh, blobs are representative of census tracts that lack access to healthy food. This is by virtue of the Economic uh, Resource uh, Center uh, with the USDA. Uh, they provided this data. A lot of people call these areas food deserts, um, but you know it doesn't really that appellation doesn't really give us a real clear understanding as to what's going on because a desert is a naturally occurring phenomenon and lack of access to healthy food, there's nothing natural about that. Um, these uh, census tracts have uh, uh, been disproportionately affected by racist policies uh, in the city uh, and the benign neglect that has occurred as a result of uh, the redlining, which I'll talk about a little later, um, is seen not only in the concentrated poverty, but it's also seen in the lack of healthy uh, food. When the USDA does this definition, it says the sister track, uh, if it doesn't have a, a grocery store within a mile or more of uh, the residents, then it's uh, labeled as a food desert. The reality is, is that there is food-like substances in these communities. You got lots of bodegas, corner stores, lots of fast food restaurants and et cetera, but none of that is really conducive to a healthy outcome in terms of quality of life and diet and nutrition, right? And lots of the individuals in these neighborhoods don't have access to transportation or have insufficient public transportation. and you know, combine that with not having enough money, right? Then you're cooking up a disaster in terms of chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, you know, even, uh, you know, the evidence is also showing that, you know, some cognitive disorders uh, or mental health disorders, uh, disassociative disorder, bipolar disorder, major depression, all of those are inextricably linked to diet as well. So, you know, these are, uh, it's, it's, it's a malady, it's a, you know, a cornucopia of pathology locked into uh, these po high poverty areas. There's another map. Uh, this map is basically an inversion of the other maps, but it's a map of the Richmond city, uh, city uh, tree canopy. So, um, why am I showing you tree canopy? Well, uh, there is a phenomenon in uh, urban centers called, an, called urban heat island effect, uh, which means that if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have tree canopy, then what you're faced with is higher degrees Celsius in the temperature in the neighborhood in which you lead and live, which results in many instances, uh, shout out to Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia, who's been doing a lot of work on this, uh, it results in higher instances of heat-related illnesses, like heat stroke, respiratory illnesses, et cetera, right? So in the summer, in the area that is, you know, formerly redlined, as you can tell, this map kind of correlates basically to that, to those other maps, uh, you see more ambulance calls for heat strokes, right? You see more ambulance calls from people being overheated as a result of the temperature. But if you live in these areas that have tree canopy, you know, you're it's several degrees uh, less. So it might be 90 degrees over here in Glen Allen almost, while it might be 100 degrees in Gilpin Court or Wickham or Fairfield or something, right? Uh, this is also an issue as it relates to stormwater management, right? So the water, when we flush the toilet, goes into the sewers, right? Same sewers uh, when somebody washes their car, all that combines. And when we have a heavy rain event, all that water goes to the wastewater treatment system. And if it overflows, it goes into the river, which is affecting our quality of life in terms of the water that we drink, right? Now, 
you know, that's a problem for everybody, not just if you live in a high concentrated poverty area, but the reality is the areas that are highly concentrated and impervious surfaces correlate with uh, concentrated poverty and lack of food access. Um, so this is a map of the, of, the, of the urban heat islands in the city, courtesy of uh, Jeremy Hoffman. As you can see, again, it correlates exactly with the uh, food uh, access map as well as the poverty map. Um, now this is the redlining map. So back in the 50s, uh, the Federal uh, uh, Housing Administration came up with you know, a program to try to help build the wealth of all Americans with the exception of African Americans, which, you know, they couldn't be more overt with this thing. Uh, as homeowners, loan corporation agents went throughout all cities across the country, major metropolitan cities, they assessed the quality of neighborhoods and uh, ranked the rank those uh, neighborhoods based on the quality of the homes and other socioeconomic factors. One of them being race. In Richmond, Virginia, uh, you had neighborhoods like uh, Jackson Ward, which uh, had high quality homes and individuals with mixed income. You had doctors, lawyers, uh, tailors, uh, 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 hairstylists, you know, craftsmen, all types of people living in Jackson Ward. This is before there was a Gilpin now, right? Um, this is called the Black Wall Street. But when the, uh, you know, so you had Maggie Walker with her bank and uh, Jackson Ward, first black female bank owner. You had the Eggleston Hotel, which was a very famous place on the, um, Chitlin Circuit, where you had people like James Brown and Duke Ellington and all these people coming down. You had um, life insurance companies. You had fraternal orders. Anyway, I'm rambling, but basically it was popping. People weren't, you know, they were hurting, but it wasn't as bad. It was actually a really nice neighborhood. Now, the homeowners loan agents go in there and say because there's Negroes in that neighborhood, they're going to fail it, which as you can see, they give it a D, which is hazardous. Um, which means basically you ain't getting no loan. Uh, so all of the neighborhoods that are red or uh, as in, you know, redlined uh, were marked in red were neighborhoods where predominantly African-Americans live. The system of redlining was so insidious that if you lived in a white neighborhood that was adjacent to a black neighborhood, you would get a C because, you know, the blacks could move, you know, freely across the border or whatever. And maybe, you know, they might see some intermingling between African-Americans and whites, right? So what happens when they redline the neighborhood? Those neighborhoods were not able to get financing for homes, mortgages, and et cetera. So that basically means that any of these folks that had homes in the neighborhood for that entire program were denied the ability to do one of the most essential tools of building wealth in this country, which is having equity in your home and being able to use that equity to finance, you know, businesses, to finance your children's education, to finance purchase of another home, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, it's no uh, surprise that these same neighborhoods are now the neighborhoods that are being gentrified um, in the city of Richmond. So I, you didn't, I know you didn't sign up for talk about redlining, so I'm going to go ahead and, you know, keep it moving. But, you know, this is the crux of why, you know, we do the work that we do, that this is the, this is the ground zero. This is, you know, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on communities of color in the city of Richmond that created the fallout that we live with in terms of lack of food access in terms of lack of affordable housing, in terms of, you know, urban heat island effect, in terms of poor educational outcomes. You know, this goes on and on and on and on and on, right? It is the policies of the past that create the realities of today. So what have we been doing? Um, so as I said earlier, our focus has been on urban agriculture and urban greening. Um, I used to work for Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden 
uh, but I was laid off due to COVID-19. Uh, While at Lewis Ginter, we developed a training program uh, that we implemented for the last three years, training over 80 individuals and community on how to develop green spaces for uh, addressing these very issues, environmental uh, issues and uh, the food access issues. Um, so this is a picture of one of our earlier cohorts as we did work in Fulton, Virginia, which is one of those neighborhoods that was raised and destroyed um, to make way for urban renewal back in the 50s. Uh, this is the kids in the classroom. Um, just show you some examples of what we've been doing. Tree planting, showing how to prune trees. This is uh, one of our gardens uh, that we developed at Six Mile Zion Baptist Church, which is one of the oldest churches that was saved from the, uh, the installation of Highway 95 that basically uh, bisected um, Jackson Ward in half and um, removed over 3,000 uh, African Americans from their homes, uh, giving them the option to either move into another neighborhood um, or if they didn't have any money, they moved into Gilpin Court. Um, there's 12 raised beds, eight fruit trees, a path. It was beautiful. It's all in memorialization of the houses that were removed uh, uh, by virtue of, of, of that uh, milady. Uh, this is a Pytown Hill Community Garden uh, where we installed several paths, shade structures, and additional raised beds and fruit trees. Some kids volunteering, putting in a living fence. This is Broad Rock Community Garden where we put in some shade structures, rain catchment systems, permeable paths to help uh, as green infrastructure, fire pits, fruit trees, um, you know, some lavender on, along the border raised beds. Um, this is Trinity Family Life Center where we put in almost 20 fruit trees. This is not an updated picture. There's also a shade structure that's over here, but I couldn't find a more recent one. Um, there's also fruit trees. Oh, and this is um, uh, us growing seedlings in the greenhouse. Um, uh, we work at Virginia, we work with Virginia Union University uh, on uh, in Ellison Hall. There's a greenhouse in there and we use that uh, for ceiling propagation that is distributed to all community gardens uh, throughout the uh, region. Uh, this is uh, some tower gardens. We did uh, this several years ago at Lakeside Elementary School. We put in some indoor agriculture tools uh, to use for STEM education for students. Uh, these towers are aeroponic. They grow all types of vegetables, especially greens. Um, indoors, you can grow food 365 days a year well. This is a vertical garden that we put in at Lakeside as well. This is growing um, strawberries. Uh, we designed this with VCU, School of Engineering and School of Art. Um, yeah, this is in their courtyard. Uh, this is McDonough Community Garden, um, where we have a shade structure, permeable paths. This is actually the oldest community garden that I've been involved with. Started this garden in 2012. Um, there's about 30 raised beds here. This is where uh, uh, community members garden. Uh, they lease a plot for the year and we um, basically provide them with compost and uh, tools and they have access to water to do their thing. Uh, this is Richmond Behavior Health Authority. We help them install uh, a garden at their uh, uh, drug addiction recovery campus uh, in Northside. Um, and we also help them plant 24 fruit trees uh, where the uh, people who are participating in that program use in their culinary arts program and, you know, they use it for chefing and, 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 and you know, uh, feeding, basically feeding folks that are in the program. Uh, this is Gilpin Court, uh, a Charles S. Gilpin community farm where we planted over uh, 20 fruit trees uh, there in honor of Lily Essis, community activist that passed away several years ago. It was her vision to develop a community farm for Gilpin Court. Uh, to increase access to healthy food, as well as to mitigate uh, crime in the neighborhood. Um, here are several of our program participants where we built uh, some raised beds here. Um, yeah, and I'll answer the question uh, in a few seconds. Uh, let's see. This is Girls for a Change, where we uh, installed uh, 12 raised beds, these uh, garden beds are used by the girls uh, in their social enterprise program. 
Uh, they grow on uh, cut flowers as well as fruits and vegetables. And this, um, as you can see, this uh, mural on the back was designed by Hamilton Glass uh, uh, last year. There's another shade structure that we put in place for the Girls for Change crew. Uh, this is Farm to Family, where we're currently farming three-fourths of an acre in Mechanicsville Turnpike, um, along with uh, my comrade and colleague, John Wilson, who was uh, laid off at Tricycle, from Tricycle Gardens when they closed up shop. Um, me and him have been building out this farm. Uh, right now, we got about a half an acre under production. And uh, before the end of the summer, we'll have the full three-fourths of an acre under production. We collaborate with Farm to Family which is a, uh, a local food aggregator. He provides a C, he basically has a CSA where you know, folks can subscribe to weekly or bi-weekly packages of fresh produce from local farmers. Produce that's grown here is sold to farm to family and distributed out. And then we also sell to members of the community. Uh, this is a sub-irrigated planter box. It's a mobile planter box. We, we uh, train the folks at Groundworks RVA and how to build mobile planter boxes that can be disseminated to senior living facilities, to business owners, and along corridors. This was at Six Pick and uh, off of Meadowbridge and Highland Park. Um, yeah, let's see what else I got. Uh, okay, yeah. So now, what are we doing? So as a result of COVID, all right, um, COVID, I got let go from Lewis Ginner, but right before, you know, when uh, the government started shutting down and all these, uh, you know, uh, announcements of like closures started coming out, we were right about to launch our next training program. I mean, literally the week that the uh, closures were announced, that was the same, the same, we had our first class the day before the closures were announced. So what we decided to do instead of completely shutting down our program. This is before we knew that Lewis Ginner was gonna close. We started, we shifted the program and said, all right, instead of us doing the class, because you know, social distancing is, you know, we couldn't get 17, 18 people in a classroom, you know, and uh, do it safely. So we said, all right, well, what we're gonna do, we came up with a, a, a structure, a infrastructure, a, 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 a people infrastructure to do delivery of raised beds directly to people's homes in a socially distanced way. Because we knew that as a result of the shutdown, people were gonna start losing their jobs, you know, and then on top of that, people are immunocompromised and they can't be going out to the grocery store or in large crowds with a pandemic upon us. So we said, all right, boom. So since we know that food insecurity was already an issue, more people are about to get laid off. And then on top of that, you know, this whole pandemic is gonna start destabilizing the food supply chain for our city, our region. And we saw it immediately. You start going to the grocery store, start seeing really spottiness, a lot of spottiness in terms of meats and things like that that were available, right? So we said, all right, boom, what we're gonna do is we're gonna help people take control of their food system by building them raised beds in their neighborhood. So we put up a form on the website um, and you know asking for people to register if they wanted to get a box as well as volunteers to register if they wanted to get uh, involved in helping to build boxes. So what we do, folks come out, pick up the soil, the soil is delivered, the people pick up, hold on a second, people uh, pick up the wood, okay. I think I'm going too fast. Where did I put that picture in there? Don't matter. Well, anyway, um, we get people to pick up the wood, they deliver the wood, and then some, another group of people or individuals will go to the person that requested the box and go and build the box for them on the site. So um, it really ends up being an amazing experience uh, with results and really amazing raised bed. So this is a this is a uh, example of a raised bed. Hope you're on. We lost you. Can't hear you right now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back now. Yeah, you're okay. good. So we can't see your screen. Okay. Hold on. Let me see. 
Okay. And just um, while he's doing that for everyone, um, when we're done, um, you can pop questions in the chat window and we'll do a Q&A when he's all wrapped up. Yeah, we can see it again. So we're good. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Okay, basically, this is the last slide anyway. So basically, all I was going to say is that we've delivered over 175 boxes since April 8th, which was my last day at Lewis Ginner. Um, we have, um, we got, we started our nonprofit uh, because, you know, once we left Lewis Ginner, you know, they shut down all their community engagement. So we needed to raise funds uh, for this work. Uh, so far, we've raised uh, close to maybe fifty thousand uh, dollars to continue doing the work. Our our goal is to raise one hundred and fifty thousand so that we can fully fund the work. Um, we got about we got hundreds of volunteers that are going out to support and building boxes for community members. Um, and then we also have uh, over four hundred requests for boxes uh, that have been made uh, in our in our work so far. So that's what I got. I'm gonna stop sharing right there. Um, you know, essentially the resiliency garden effort addresses people that have homes. So we're moving into the next phase where we're going to be developing gardens at black churches throughout neighborhoods inside of the city of Richmond. So we are all, we're we're taking requests from churches to identify property that could be transformed into uh, green space, community gardens, urban farms. Um, and with the funding that we receive, we'll be going out to go develop um, uh, those types of spaces to help, you know, make room for individuals that don't have a backyard that maybe live in an apartment or have a really shaded, you know, uh, backyard or what have you. Um, so that the work of building resiliency through urban agriculture is really about localizing the food production, connecting people to where their food comes from, and helping people be a participant in, you know, their own uh, reality. You know, they're not dependent upon food pantries and processed foods that come from those sources in order to feed themselves to be able to grow their own food and not only grow their own food, but also get the therapeutic benefits that come along with gardening and growing and being able to go outside and doing something productive at the same time. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions lined up for you before we take on some uh, questions from the group. A reminder again, uh, in the chat or QA at the bottom, you can add questions and Tara will, will pull them from there. Um, first question I wanted to ask was, what are some ways that people can get involved with or support your projects? Um, yeah, so the one of the clearest ways is that we have um, a volunteer registration uh, a database that we've been building since April. Uh, which asks if individuals are able to deliver raised beds, if they're able to um, help build raised beds, if they're able to deliver soil, if they're able to grow seedlings that can be distributed to community members, uh, if they can help with fundraising, you know, things like that. Uh, those are all spaces that we have uh, need for uh, collaboration and volunteerism in that space. We are just now getting to the point of readiness to begin doing small scale community garden cleanups and garden farm work days, which will have no, no more than four to eight people involved at a time, right? So we'll be starting that up uh, within the next, well, we did one last, uh, the last two weeks. And so they're, they're, they're officially kind of like already going, but you, you know, I could send you the link uh, for it. I could put it in the chat for folks to register for that. Uh, that's the easiest way. And, you know, really we try to create a system where you don't have to be in a large group. You can do these, you know, volunteer opportunities, solo dolo, you know what I mean? Or with you know, a small clique of folks that you know, you know, ain't out here as carriers or whatever, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can be very <laughs> contained and safe, you know, so we could do the contact tracing and the whole thing, you know, with it. So, um, yeah, that's, 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 okay. that's, that's how you can get involved. Hey, what's the website to go to? I know you're going to find it to us, but just some folks can, uh, can hear it. Yeah, uh, thenaturalfestival.com. The Natural Festival. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. And then also, so historically, so were you a gardener first or what kind of got you into this passion and turning into a movement? Uh, well, you know, be honest with you, man. Um, I, uh, I wasn't a gardener at all coming up. I got 
into this because of uh, uh, I've, I've run this festival, this Happily Natural Day. I've been doing this since 2003. Um, I started off working at the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. And through that space of the Black History Museum and Happily Natural Day, um, I met Black farmers who uh, my first foray with them was through the development of a mobile farmer's market, a pop-up farmer's market called the Richmond New War Market, where we would connect the farmer to communities that didn't have access to healthy food. You know, we would just set up a market, you know, accept purchases through SNAP and the whole thing. Um, and we did that for probably four years before we started our first garden. Uh, but when I started the garden uh, in 2012, it was like when, li that was like lightning striking and I realized how important land is and how important it is for us to be getting our hands dirty and being a part of the food system in terms of the production as well as the distribution. And in order for us to really address the food access issues, we gotta address economic development issues, which, you know, the core issue for communities is that they are impoverished and, you know, racism, but we could, you know, if we focus on the self-determination of those communities to insulate them from, you know, those mitigating factors that led up to lack of food access, then, you know, we can break that curse of, uh, uh, you know, them not having healthy food because they can grow their own. I mean, the whole conversation around farmer land dispossession, um, discrimination by the USDA, all, of course, all that type of stuff has to be addressed, but we can start where we are. The city of Richmond has, uh, man, it's, I can't remember the figure. It's, 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 a, it's almost 4,000 vacant lots exist throughout the city of Richmond alone. This is not even thinking wow. about vacant uh, property that might exist on parkland or that might exist in the county as well. So, uh, or in the counties, plural. So anyway, uh, okay. that's how I got involved. And Okay. And then I mean, since you're, I guess, kind of newer to farming, but you're doing a ton of it. I mean, so either through the farming or through the systems or the, you know, municipalities you had to work with, what are some of the biggest struggles you had to overcome and how'd you overcome them? Um, I say the biggest struggle that we had to overcome was um, probably land access, the space to actually stretch out and do this type of do the type of growing that you know is necessary to really make a make make a significant impact. That was a big hurdle, um, but through collaboration, we were able to you know mitigate that. Uh, I now serve on the board for the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. Uh, which has a uh, focus on housing, but also a focus on urban agriculture. So we're working out the kinks to try to get access to land for folks that want to do this type of work. Um, the other issue that is just that people didn't really understand uh, what uh, urban agriculture was. People, so people don't understand, first of all, people don't understand farming. People don't understand agriculture, period. You know what I mean? People just see broccoli frozen in the you know, grocery store, frozen food section is like, all right, where'd that come from? It just magically appeared. So, um, you know, getting people to understand what agriculture is all about, you know, um, just how intrinsic it is, uh, how communal it is, and how, you know, all civilization has uh, arose through organized systems of food production, right? And, you know, right now we're in a very compromised position. I mean, I didn't really have to explain much when we say, hey, COVID is shutting down, you know, the food system. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, people that grow the food, yeah, they're sick. They can't get to the farm. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, that, that, that's the issue. So some of this stuff has been self-explanatory, but, uh, um, but a lot of it has just been policy, uh, trying to get the policies uh, in place that uh, recognizes the need for localized food production and localized as being in the urban core as well. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Tara. She has a couple questions from uh, the group. And again, anyone listening, if you have any questions about any of the presentation or things that weren't brought up, feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, we'll get them asked. Uh, Tara, you have some questions for us? Yep, um, so I'm gonna try to group some similar questions here. Um, getting some questions from folks around seeds or seedlings. So if folks have extra seeds from their gardens or seedlings that they're not using, is there a way that they can drop them off so that your group can leverage those? Yes, uh, we are staging our uh, uh, wood cutting and the materials for the Resiliency Garden Project at Trinity Family Life Center, which is 3601 
Dale Road, and individuals can drop um, ceilings off there. Uh, just hit us up and let us know that they're there so we can pick them up, make sure that they're watered, and get them into the distribution chain that we've been developing. Uh, we have a whole database of everyone that's received uh, a box from us. And we have volunteers that are basically contacting them and dropping off ceilings to them after they've gotten their box built. Awesome, thank you. Um, have another question about, um, sounds like a couple of different groups, Virginia Food Access Investment Program and RRHA. Are those groups working with your group to help fund or to help encourage garden space at their properties? So the Virginia Food Access Investment Program is a program, a form of legislation that just passed with uh, Delegate uh, Dolores McQuinn at the helm. Uh, they just approved that and signed off on the thing uh, today, matter of fact. Um, but um, the, uh, they're still working out the refinement and the kinks. Uh, I think it's going to go live next week. We're waiting on some guidance in terms of how, you know, we'll be able to participate in that program. Uh, looking at the legislation, it looks pretty robust in terms of the distribution side. We're trying to figure out how we can build the farmers into that whole, you know, effort on a collaborative, uh, holistic uh, approach to addressing food access. Um, but I, I anticipate that that is going to be an amazing opportunity for us to build out value-added processing space, cold storage, um, distribution systems, uh, box trucks, and et cetera, for moving produce to and fro and actually doing the type of things that uh, support farmers uh, in terms of getting that food to community. Um, and uh, about RRHA, um, yeah, RRHA has been, uh, uh, they've, they've been good. Uh, they've got a whole lot of stuff going on <laughs> on their side. So, you know, it's been, you know, yeah, you just kind of do the double dutch of trying to get in where you can fit in and in, in, in their conversation. But um, Ralph Stuckey, uh, who's one of the uh, admin over there, we just were on an email with him now talking about doing a garden at uh, after, in Afton or uh, on Southside at Greystone uh, Place. And uh, they just gave us the green light that that's a go. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, and then we also did a garden in Hillside Court earlier this year with one of the uh, residents, Maisha Gould, uh, and uh, and crew. So I mean, we've had some really great success with working with RHA. You know, they they've been open to it. The, the core conversation has been community involvement and having people that are living in those communities active and engaged and on the front end of the request. Like we're not, at, you know, I haven't approached any body in the housing project to start a garden there. Any of our projects have come from residents of those communities asking us to support them in the development of those garden spaces. So when we get those requests, we're down for that action. I mean, it's because I'm not going to, I don't live in the act and I don't live in the public housing, you know, so I'm not going to act like I'm going to be out there every day trying to build a garden out. But if the community requests it, then we got the resources for them and we're going to support them in, in, in doing what it is that they want to do. Awesome, great information, thank you. Yes, um, yes. So I, I think one thing to make sure that we don't forget it, because I'm sure tons of folks will also think of questions later or just really wanna get involved. What are some good ways to follow the work that you're doing or to just get in touch and know uh, what the next thing is that your group needs help with? Yeah, so um, we got a group on, uh, for the Resiliency Gardens. We got a group called Resiliency Gardens on Facebook. Um, uh, you can follow Happily Natural Day on Facebook, uh, Deron Chavis on Instagram. Um, you can go to the naturalfestival.com and join our email list. Um, we're trying to get better with sending regular emails. There's just been so much going on. I'm not the best. <laughs> I'm saying like, ah, I wish I had more time, you know what I mean, to, to do email blasts, but I'm not, you know, adept in that, but I'm trying to do better. Uh, so, you know, Instagram, though, and the social medias, we do try to post on that regularly and keep people up to date. So you can, Deron Chavis on anything, Happily Natural Day on anything. Um, you just do a Google search uh, for any of those social media handles 
and you know stay connected like that that that's probably the most prime and there's a bunch of sites that we that we partner with too so you know if it's not me then you know follow one of the partner sites because it's not you know all this stuff is not happily natural day this is like collaborations with other community groups that we're in support of and collaborating with uh, so you know you see uh, see their stuff on 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 our pages go follow them too there might be some spaces close to you where you live uh, that you can get involved in and support awesome thanks so much yeah man thank y'all that's a good question though how to stay how to stay synced up <laughs> especially in the age of COVID. I got all this equipment. I'm trying to, I was trying, I bought the camera. I'm trying to do the live stream and it's not even working. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I need you. I'm going to have to help me out to get the live stream going. There you go, folks. We have a request for help. So if anybody's good at that. Yeah, for sure. Head, head that way. <laughs> um, Tara, are there any more questions in the chat? I, uh, I can't pull it up right now. Um, I think we got through most of the questions. Yep. Okay, I had I had one more about the question about the land. So uh, a lot of the discussion around like the the land use or lack of land use. Um, I mean, in addition to like land being taken from people, can you speak a little more about that? And that's kind of a new thing for me. And there's an article, I think last year in the Atlantic about black farmers in the South getting their farms taken, but I didn't know much about that kind of thing in Richmond. And then I also want to hear more about like the empty lots and what are there ways to get that land used for urban agriculture? Yeah, so that, that question about the farmers is deep, man. Um, in the 92nd uh, elevated talk is that black farmers used to have almost 14% of farmland. Uh, and in 2020, it's like less than 1%, right? Uh, in between uh, reconstruction and now, uh, what we've seen is that uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s, farmers were supportive of the civil rights movement. And a lot of them housed freedom riders and organizations like SNCC uh, on their land when those uh, freedom riders came down into the South to register voters. And once, you know, Civil Rights Act passed and that movement diminished, those farmers were left uh, vulnerable to the attacks by city officials and municipal leaders that were very much vengeful, right? So paper terrorism where people got their land taken away, um, uh, denial of applications for assistance from the USDA. Uh, so folks were crippled in their ability to participate in the agricultural industry because as other farmers mechanized their farms, black farmers were left out back and couldn't get the same type of funding and resources to do the same type of upgrades to their farms that their uh, uh, counterparts were doing. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, that plus the fact that the ter racial terrorism in the South were forcing black and brown people to move into urban centers. You know, people just got turned off and um, uh, left the rural areas. And when those, when they left those rural areas, um, when people passed away, uh, you had like six people, uh, six siblings that were children of the farmer. Uh, when it came time for the will or for the land to be passed on, you got six people that are in ownership of a piece of property and all six of them got to be in agreement as to what to do with the with the property, right? And when they couldn't figure it out, you know, uh, you know, taxes are accruing, right? So then, you know, suddenly taxes, you know, okay, you know, you got tax delinquent property. Um, on top of that, um, you know, some farmers got in over the head with predatory lending, just similar, same way that uh, banks uh, were predatory to homeowners and urban communities and marginalized black and brown communities, farmers were also targeted too. And a lot of them lost their land through, you know, these acts of uh, uh, really faulty mortgage pro products that put them at risk of losing their farm in that way. So it's a lot, you know, that, but that's something, yeah. um, that's something that uh, we're trying to figure out how to address through the use of land trusts. Um, land trusts is a way of preserving and protecting land and puts it into uh protection in perpetuity uh so there's organizations like the uh agrarian trust out of boston that's really focused on trying to acquire uh farmland and make it available for burgeoning farmers of, of a young age and for marginalized communities to do their work on those spaces 
Uh, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust is dedicated to urban agriculture and is in talks about acquiring property specifically for farming um, throughout the region uh, to, to make available for communities of color as well. So uh, those are all things that are like fledgling and kind of like in the works. Um, you know, there is an organization called the uh, Black Church Food Security Network that's dedicated to getting farmland from faith-based communities and making that land available for, for folks to farm. So um, yeah, and then, I mean, as far as the city, the city has vacant property that you can apply for and turn into a community garden um, or an urban farm. Uh, so um, really excited about that. Uh, Two has been around for a while. Uh, McDonough Community Garden, Brow Rock Community Garden, Fulton Community Garden, Stockton, Garber Street Community Garden. Oh man, there's, there's, there's about eight, to a dozen different community gardens that are all on city property in the city of Richmond. And there's more that could be made, that could be uh, applied for. It's like 50 bucks for a year for the, for the application, 25 bucks a year. Um, and yeah, these are all great people. There's a Foncella food forest. Folks are not just doing gardens, they're doing food forests. You know, people are just doing beautification. Um, yeah, it's all over the place. Awesome. So I think we're getting close to wrapping up, but we do have one question that might lead to a couple other questions. Um, what, from a seedling perspective, are there certain things that you all need more than anything right now? So we've got somebody on the on the chat who has some taters that they oh, can yeah. send your way, but um, is there anything else particular that you all really need? Um, yeah, 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 man. Uh, squash, uh, you know, summer stuff is, is, it's already summer, so don't start no more <laughs> summer stuff. <laughs> it's a wrap for that jack by the time it's ready it's gonna summer's gonna be uh over uh but uh yeah we 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 are looking for like fall crops so um you know winter squash garlic onions sweet potatoes um you know to be candid i'm looking for perennials and herbs rosemary sage uh native plants so um you know, Rudakia, Black Eye Susan, Kaposis, uh, 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 what else? Um, Tixie, uh, yeah, anything, anything perennial flower, any perennial flowers, bro, I'm bring them. I'm, I'm looking for as many perennial flowers as possible because we need pollinators. Is, you know, starting these gardens is not just about a bunch of vegetables, it's about also having you know, flowers that can attract butterflies, bees, insects that can help uh, get the plants pollinated, but also help build the biodiversity in the green space that's necessary for the soil to be healthy, for the space to be healthy overall. So um, I'm really big on doing a biodiverse green space. Um, so if you have, you know, a desire to do seedlings, you know, the more flowers and things like that that you can do, uh, more herbs, perennial herbs that you could do, the better we, we can you know get the, the vegetable seeds but it's a lot harder for us to get uh to pay attention to the to the flower to perennial flowers and things like that so if you can get your hands on those that'd be amazing um and we could distribute those all throughout the city you know what i mean that's not just for any of our projects that's like you know the medians you know uh, all of these new street uh improvements that are happening how can we you know put some perennial flowers in those spaces that'll come back every year you know, that's, that's really, that's really a focus of ours, you know, is to try to make sure stuff is as biodiverse as possible. All right. I think we're probably just about out of time. There was another question about aquaponics, but I bet that's probably a longer answer. So Kenyatta, sorry, we couldn't squeeze that one in. Um, but I think we all live in the same neighborhood. So maybe we can track each other down and talk about aquaponics a little bit. I'm also interested that's in that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably another, another half an hour. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you for joining us. This has been very fascinating. Uh, we covered a whole lot of topics, um, and this was a, a great turnout. Uh, so everyone involved, we will uh, we'll share out the links that Duran talked about and ways to get involved and volunteer. Um, and then on the screen, you can see if you want to get involved with the green team, you can join us on Pulse. Uh, you can get us on Slack. Um, and as always, bring friends because I feel like there's always folks uh, that you know that want to be more environmentally kind.